Hey, welcome to Fringe FM Tech Talks. I'm your host, Matt Ward, and this is the segment where we jump on the live stream and we talk about exponential technologies that are affecting all of us. Today we'll be talking about clean meat, literally, lab-grown meat. You don't have to go out there and kill a bull, kill a fish. We can grow it in a lab. Here's what's happening, when it's happening, and why it matters. But first, before we jump into that, I'm really excited about the future of biotech and Nutritech to extend human life. We just did a really, really exciting panel on Fringe FM. If you haven't checked out Fringe FM, it's like a long-form TED. We get the world's smartest folks when it comes to AI, genetics, space, quantum computing, you name it. If it's something that's going to be massively affecting the future, we have the smartest folks in those fields on to discuss not only their fields, but the, the tangential and converging technologies to, so we can better predict, align, and build a, build a better future. So it was a really interesting episode. If you guys go to Fringe FM and search for Biotech or Biotech Roundtable, you can find that. It's also here on YouTube. So if you just hit the subscribe button and go through, you can find we had Aubrey de Grey. Thanks. Humans have been alive that will live to a thousand years of age. They're already living now. We had Mike Selden, who is revolutionizing clean meat when it comes to growing fish in a lab. And Jenny, Jenny Rourke, she's a VC that invested in the CRISPR, uh, the CRISPR folks and a bunch of other really interesting companies focused on using technology and that combination of computing plus biology to rapidly transform the world. It was really interesting and worthwhile. I recommend checking it out, fringe.fm or check right here on YouTube. But today, today we're talking about clean meat. And I'll be honest, I was a vegetarian for, geez, like 18 years, some, some ridiculous amount, 15 years, something ridiculous. And it was, I found out where meat came from. And oh, now I felt sad because animals were dying and I, I didn't want to do it. Eventually, I gave up being a vegetarian because it turns out it's really not that great for your health, which we might talk about a bit more here, but it's also something where just having a bit more selection and choice, it's, uh, it's valuable and it's fun and it's hard to find food in college. But you know what? I'm still pretty passionate about the, the suffering of animals and what we go through with this animal agriculture industry, and that's why I'm wicked pumped about clean meat, and I think this is going to be transformational to society. So... How does clean meat work? Well, inside all of us, we have a little factory. That factory is growing, well, for a lot of us, it's growing too much fat, but it's also growing muscle and all other kinds of things that go into the body. Like when you eat a steak and you see these different things, yeah, that's what's going on. It's just, it's on the inside of someone else. Well, what clean meat is doing is that's taking that and it's, it's making it in a factory type model. So similar to how breweries would brew beer and you pour in these different ingredients and eventually you've got something that'll get you just completely hammered. Well, it's the same deal, but with, with meat. So they're growing meat by taking cells, cells from existing healthy tissue of existing healthy animals and using that to expand outward, kind of like growing corn with corn kernels. It just keeps growing and expanding if you're able to keep the keep the situation right. So clean meat has some massive, massive potential, but some major problems ahead of it as well. Um, in terms of a bit of an overview, the overall meat market today, $844 billion. As an angel investor and someone who likes to help startups make some money and scale, that is a massive freaking market opportunity. $844 billion. That's bigger than Facebook. Well, it's not bigger than Amazon anymore. But to be honest, I would, I would foresee that global meat market expanding because what we found with, with, with most first world economies is as you start to become more successful, you have more money, you spend a lot more of that money on meat and getting a, a more wholesome type diet. Well, as more and more countries are becoming more um, successful economically, I would see a ton of money starting to go into the meat industry and making it even larger. Now, to, to have a little bit more of a, a background, why clean meat is so important. Animal agriculture makes up 9% of CO2 emissions worldwide, globally, 9%. That's a big freaking number. But 37% of the methane, i.e., I mean methane, when you fart, that's pretty much a methane. That's pretty much methane. Well, most of those farts are coming from cows and other animals that we're raising for meat. 37% of them, to be in fact. And that's a major contributor of greenhouse emissions and global warming or climate change. But 61% of the even dirtier nitrous oxide, that also is from the animal agriculture industry. There's a lot of negativity coming from this industry, not to mention pain and suffering of billions of animals. Speaking of billions, the average person in the entire world consumes 41.9 kilograms of meat per year. That's 700 billion pounds of meat per year that we're eating. Now, if you do the math on that, then a pound of meat is a little bit, 
more than a dollar, but still, 700 billion pounds. That's a shit ton of food. Well, normal agriculture, if you've ever agriculture, animal agriculture, the reason why we're able to eat meat is we try to avoid those the, those commercials, etc., showing the animal suffering that happens here. And we're not going to get into that too much because none of us want to talk about it that much. But that's because we all kind of realize that it's it's dirty, it's, it's a bit evil, it feels wrong, and it's something where we kind of like to push it off to the side. Like thinking about people that have to work on building our iPhones, working in warehouses that are too hot, etc. We kind of like to have ignorance because ignorance can be bliss. But clean meat, that gives us the opportunity to reinvent the way that we eat and to make us quite a bit healthier in the process. Let's talk about the implications of clean meat. So as we move towards a clean meat society, one, right now we have tons of farmers and what are they doing? They're farming, whether it's food or they're doing animal agriculture, which I find f hard to consider farming, but st same thing. Well, a lot of that already is at pretty large scale. So we have a mass uh, agriculture industry that's built around essentially factories as farms, factory farming of animals. The conditions aren't great and the, the health outcomes aren't as good, et cetera. That's why people will pay more for grass-fed this, grass-fed that, um, locally raised versus growing up in cages because there's a lot more infection, there's a lot more viruses, there's a lot more uh, toxins, et cetera, that come from eating things that are coming out of a cage. But as we go towards uh, a clean meat society, so what this is going to look like, like we had Mike Selden of Finless Foods, he was on our biotech roundtable, and we did an interview with him as well. If you haven't checked it out, fringe.fm, look for that one, highly recommend it. It's really, really interesting take on where we're headed. But as we move towards a world where things are being produced not in a farm but on a lab, it takes a hell of a lot more money to start a lab than it does to start a farm. So as we have more and more expense going into getting started, we see a smaller and smaller shrinking of the actual number of manufacturers of meat. It'll be large factories and large companies versus smaller scale farmers. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? We'll talk about that a little bit more in the future, but it will displace a lot of those meat farmers. What happens to their businesses? What happens to the business in general when there are fewer players? Do we get into a monopoly type situation? Hopefully not, because clean meat has the opportunity for people around the world to eat healthier, to have better access to meat, which is something that everybody wants and is generally speaking pretty good for you. Another implication that I would think about when it comes to clean meat is we've seen a major backlash recently against GMOs or large agri-tech companies like Monsanto, etc. For good reasons and for bad reasons. I think the good reasons revolve around types of toxins and types of chemicals, etc. that are used for production of certain GMOs. I think, uh, I think glyphosate is one of, the, one of the more common culprits. But at the same time, a lot of what's gone into this industry has been anti-science. So, for instance, I like to say to people, you can have a baby or you can have GMOs. Because if you look as the world population increases, we have to be able to feed these people. Unless we want to say to, and let's be brutally honest, unless we want to say to Africa, sorry guys, you can go starve yourselves to death. We're going to have to find a way to feed more people without waste, with food that lasts longer, but with food that's also healthy. So what happens as we start to grow things in factories? Well, this is as anti-wild as it gets. Maybe it's better for us, maybe it's healthier, but will there be a backlash like there has been against va vaccines where people just say, well, you know what, this is not how it used to be, so it's not what I want. That, um, yeah, that creates a major problem, but at the same time, those same people that want things to be healthy and normal and natural, do they also want to go outside and shoot a cow in the head? Yeah, dramatic pause. It's, it makes you think a little bit. There's, there's some ethical norms around this. There's some pollution norms around this. All of this goes into clean meat and it's what has me excited, but yet there are some potential problems. But let's talk about the pros. So it's way more ethical. We just said 700 billion, uh, 700 billion pounds of meat per year. Well, that's a lot of animals that live a shitty life and have to die. Letting that not have to happen is something where that's better for everyone including the animals. If you're living in a life that is a net negative, most likely, then taking that life out of the equation means that you have more positivity in the world. So just from that perspective, I think, especially as someone who used to be a vegetarian, this is something that's incredibly important. But reducing pollution, that's something where, regardless of how you feel about the ethics, we, uh, climate change is 100% proven by science, regardless of what you may hear from other people that are paid from other industries. Reducing pollution is, pretty goddamn important. We have major problems right now with the amount of greenhouse gas and uh, global rise in temperature that we have to be able to reduce that, especially for the future, especially as more and more countries become more developed and demand larger access to resources, etc. This is a big freaking deal. 
lower cost and access, fairer access for everyone. That's what eventually happens when you're able to produce at scale. It's the reason why, well, the, well okay, that's a bad example because Apple just increases their prices. Let's talk about, let's talk about computers. What would a supercomputer cost in the 80s? Well, you know what? The iPhone you're holding is also a supercomputer. It's hell of a lot cheaper and way more people have access to this now because of this technology proliferation. The same thing will happen with Cleanly as we're able to scale up that production. The costs come way down, the access goes way up, and everybody, everybody ends up a little bit better and healthier. Speaking of healthier, we're able to design better meats. So there are just certain things that we know are not good to be eating. So specifically, I mean, we can talk about this more later, but we'll talk. We will talk about this more later. But mo but most carbs and um, <clears throat> things that come in a box, those are generally speaking not very good. A lot of the meat that we're eating, it might be contaminated. So, mad cow is not that common, but there are other toxins, etc. We know that injecting animals with antibiotics is not great for humans because having too much antibiotics makes you antibiotic resistant, among many many other things. We talked in with Finless Foods by twenty by twenty fifty. The ocean will be more plastic than it will be fish. Well, that's not very good for the fish that we're eating out of the ocean. All of these things have health implications when you're raising animals in situations that are much less than ideal. And that is majorly negative towards humans. What's, I mean, what do you imagine would happen to you if you went and started eating plastic every day? I can't imagine it would turn out very well. So we're able to design better food for humans. We're also able to design tastier food. Suddenly you can have a cheap steak that tastes like a million freaking bucks, or it could taste like bananas and apples or whatever the hell you want it to taste like. Because as we are able to genetically engineer what we're making, both from selection of the medium meats, etc., to extra inserts and proprietary things that will probably go into a lot of these clean meats, we're able to do some really interesting stuff. Another thing that I find really interesting, a massive portion, I, I don't have the stat in front of me, I had it earlier, I want to say something like 20% of the, of the world is used for land use and farming, i.e. we need all of this space to be able to do farming. Well, if suddenly we're able to cut out all of that and have a skyscraper that's raising high quality beef, bison, salmon, etc., in a nice little laboratory controlled condition so the temperatures are just right and everything is perfectly fine tuned, we have a shit ton more space for humanity, for living, for, I mean, if we're going to start removing farms, we might as well at least move some of this back to being biodiverse and natural because you know what, now we have the space to do that. Well, that all of these things are really interesting implications. And then, um, Probably the biggest pro is going upward, really upward, as we go to space. How the heck else are we going to eat meat? The answer is we're not, because it costs $1,000 per kilogram right now to launch something into space. Well, if we can launch production facilities that are able to grow meat, suddenly as humanity becomes a space-faring civilization, we're able to eat beef and cow and stay healthy and not have to just eat, yeah, really boring stuff that you would see on Star Trek that looks, it looks like it comes out of a military uh, MM, MRO or meal-ready kit that looks terrible. Cons of, cons of clean meat. It's going to take a while to reach cost parity. So uh, a couple of years ago, you could buy like a $90,000 burger. The costs are coming way down, and we can see the exponential nature. I hope uh, it's a little bit weird when you see it with the webcam. But the, yeah, the costs are coming exponentially down as, as the scale goes Inca up, and the technology and capital costs that go into getting started come down as well. Those are all really, really good, but the, the cost parity thing is still going to be a problem for a while. That said, within a couple of years, we're getting pretty darn close, based off of the information I have, to cost parity. When, and when it comes down to it, would you rather eat an animal that's been killed and lived in a shitty condition, or something that's been lab-grown that had no death? I think the, the answer is pretty obvious, and it's at least something that takes off pretty quickly. But still, it, the, it is a con because it takes a while to get there. The high startup costs mean fewer growers. Well, having less decentralization means that you're more prone to attack, more prone to problems. Well, if one a factory of six in the entire country suddenly has some type of outbreak, suddenly you have a massive scale problem on your hands versus a smaller farmer having issues with salmonella, etc. What about patents and important formulas? So. What we've seen with companies is they do everything in their power to build a moat around what they're doing. With clean meat, we want this to be something where the world has access, we're able to remove as much animal agriculture and suffering as possible. Well, if this is something where companies are building up patent portfolios and suing people out of existence and trying to prevent other people from having the best practices of making healthy yada yada yada, that's not very good for consumers if we're preventing people from having healthier, better options and access. So that could be a major problem that I see coming forward. Um, genetic biodiversity, so as we start to have more and more 
clean meat being the meat that we're consuming, we have less and less animals on the planet. Now, a lot of these animals are suffering, yes, but it also means less animals. Do you think we're going to keep as many cows, as many chickens? As Chickens might be a little different. It might be tough to bioengineer eggs, at least that look like eggs for a while. But in terms of the animals, we'll have way, way less because we have no need for them. Look at a picture of 1900s New York City, and you'll see hundreds, thousands of horse-drawn carriages. Look at a picture of New York City 10 years later, and you will see almost none. The advent of the automobile meant that we didn't need horses anymore, and we don't have poop all along the sidewalks, which is why houses in New York, you see they have the elevated, the elevated uh, where you walk up to get into the entrance because it was just covered in shit and no one would want to live down there. But we'll see similar types of implications as suddenly farms, we don't need these animals anymore. Why are we going to keep growing them if they're putting methane and pollution out into the environment and suffering and costing money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? We won't. They'll just kind of start to die off and have much, much fewer amount of di biodiversity. That said, if we use that space, because now suddenly we have free space, if we use that space to create parks and jungles, et cetera, where we can try to save some of what humanity has destroyed, that could, be, that could be super interesting. Predictions. Let's talk predictions. Everybody likes predictions. I like predictions. Most people hate making predictions because they're fear about being wrong. I'm not worried about being wrong. I'm going to be wrong. But the nature of a prediction is it makes you think about the future in a different way so that you either do something different, create the future in a different way, or are able to foresee what potentially could happen. So I'm going to say in 10 to 15 years, 80% of the meat that's consumed in first world countries will be lab grown. And that is going to sound really, really controversial to change an $844 billion industry in 10 to 15 years. But I think the network effects of, oh my God, are you really eating, are you really eating a dead, a dead fucking pig? Are you serious, man? I think the network effects of the judgment and our own internal judgment of the suffering that animals go through will lead to really, really fast changes that combined with the cost changes. So within 10 to 15 years, the cost parity should be flipped. Clean meat should be cheaper than actual farm-grown or um, cage-grown meat. It should be significantly cheaper, and as it's significantly cheaper and there's a moral incentive to change, those changes happen really, really fast. So I would, yeah, I would predict 10 to 15 years, 80%-ish. Future generations are going to view slaughter as one of the greatest crimes of our time. Now, we've had a lot of crimes as humanity. That's kind of what we do. It's a, it's a power world out here. But this is definitely one of them where if you look at just the number of lives that have been taken, it's a really, really large number. And people will argue the ethics this way and that. You can see when you look... Um, People talk about animals being different than humans, but humans are just animals that are slightly more intelligent, so have, we have more emergent behavior than most animals. At the same time, there's been a lot of suffering that we've propagated, both for ourselves and for others. So I think that future generations will view this as just completely barbaric. And then, as we said before, the majority of domesticated animals that were raised for meat are just going to disappear, probably 80-ish 80, 80 percent, which actually has some pretty strong benefits. So if you look historically... You can find a TED Talk on this called, um, oh, what's it called? I can't remember what it's called, but it's about rewilding nature. And animals were always evolved to roam in herds, animals that grazed. They roamed in herds, and they would move around looking for food. Because they moved around, they would destroy ground, grass, etc. They would poop in different places, and they would not overdo it on any part of the land. Well, with farming, when p animals are living in a single location, suddenly you're pooping in the same place over and over and over. You're killing the grass by eating it over and over and over. That's not sustainable for the environment naturally, so farmers had to do more in terms of pesticides, herbicides, and enhancements to the land, and it's led to some rage, major, major degradation of the soil quality. Well, what they found is if you're able to change the way that herds or animals start with uh, grazing and have them move in more natural ways, the world is able to regenerate itself. Well, it'll be interesting as we get rid of some of these domesticated animals, if that just naturally starts to lead to health and rejuvenation of some of these lands that have been a bit destroyed. Those are some of the thoughts that I have about clean meat. I am super, super excited. I still have not my, had my first lab-grown burger, steak, etc., but I would definitely be interested if we've got any lab-grown meat companies listening and they want to donate one, because right now they're still, they're still pretty damn expensive, then I would definitely be willing to eat that on air. But... In terms of us and what we do, if you haven't visited Fringe.fm and you find this interesting, you got to go do that. Fringe.fm. We have the world's smartest folks, TED-type people. I want to say 60 to 70% of our guests have been on TED or TEDx. We have them on. But rather than a 5 or 10-minute talk about some specific topic, 
we talk about everything. We talk for an hour, an hour and a half on AI, genetics, we move into space, and then suddenly we talk about what's happening in your gut and how that's affecting you as a human being. We talk about everything. Because you know what? The world is a system. Everything goes together, and in an era of exponential technologies, everything is fucking converging. And that makes the world very important to understand from multiple perspectives. You can't just understand AI. You can't just understand biotech. Separate, they make no sense. You can't understand that the reason why genetic engineering and genome testing is moving so quickly is because AI is advancing and allowing us to process massive amounts of data. Without having those interconnectedness and the spontaneity that happens from those kind of conversations, there's no way you can really understand the, the future, where it's headed, and how to make your mark. Fringe.fm. If you've liked this, subscribe on YouTube. That little button right there will make sure that you don't miss out. We have live streams every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. EST, 6.30 p.m. Central European time. You can hop on here, ask questions, etc. This was a live stream that we're redoing now that we have a better microphone and a better setup. But for the next time, if you've got questions, hop on 12.30 p.m. EST, ask questions. I'll answer them live on air and we will discuss the future, where it's headed and try to, try to get all of us involved with building something better. Until next time, I'm your host, Matt Ward. Check out Fringe FM and... Yeah, I need some coffee, so I will talk to you guys again later. Cheers.